Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal from Continuing Church of God. Today I'd like to do the third part of a series that we've been doing covering the continuing history of the Church of God. This time we're going to focus on the 17th through 20th centuries, but in prior sermons uh, we focused on from Acts chapter 2, roughly 31 AD, to the uh, 300 AD, and the second set was from the 4th to the 16th centuries. And before I go into the uh, 17th to 20th centuries, just a brief overview. A lot of people are surprised when they look into uh, church history, especially early church history, what the original Christian church believed. Oddly, most people who profess Christianity do not understand what original Christians taught. They said, well, I'm sure they taught what the Bible taught and what the apostles taught. That's correct. Sadly, however, uh, throughout the centuries, various theologians and writers and religious leaders have given people a different impression of a lot of different of the doctrines and practices of the original Christian church. We have a booklet that we've been going through for this particular series. It's a fairly, uh, in one respect, it's a comprehensive booklet because it's over 120 pages or so. But it's also a short booklet because to go through all there is to go on church history, there's volumes and volumes of things. But this particular booklet goes over, for example, early doctrines that the original church had, as well as when heresies sprung up and who stood against the heresies and who stood for the truth. And it goes through the Church of God throughout history. Anyway, we left off the last one. Uh, at the end of the, uh, the 16th century. And in the uh, 17th century, by the, by the 17th century, which starts at 1601, I guess is when that would start, we've had the rise of what's called uh, the Sardis era, the Church of God. Go through the book of Revelation. There are seven churches mentioned. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, uh, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And we've covered the other, the previous eras, and now we're starting to get into the Sardis era. Roughly 1,200, well, 1260 years after the church fled into the wilderness in the fourth century, it started to pop up again. And this is when we started to see a lot of things happen with the uh, Sardis era, the Church of God. Now, this is covered in a booklet that we have. Uh, freely available. It's at ccog.org. It's called The Continuing History of the Church of God. And we've got it in a, a couple different, several different languages, and we expect to have it in more in the future. But let me go through some of this here. I'd like to read something about the Church of God in England. It says, in the late 1640s, now this is by Byron W. Ball, with new religious liberty and freedom of expression and practice, the seventh day came into the open in a way previously unknown in England. So by the middle of the 17th century, you could get away with, <laughs> if that's the right word, uh, keeping the Sabbath. Uh, it wasn't as much of a problem as it had been prior to that. People had to keep it more secretly, if you will. Now, the Catholic Encyclopedia had a few comments about uh, the, the 16th and century, 17th century. It says, persons rejecting infant baptism are frequently mentioned in English history in the 16th century. So, it says, as early as 1535, 10 Anabaptists were put to death, and the persecutions continued throughout that century. The victims seemed to have been mostly Dutch and German refugees. So what the Catholic Encyclopedia is saying is, look, there were people in the 1600s, excuse me, 16th century, the 1500s, who were Anabaptists. Now, if you don't know what that term means, they call them Anabaptists because it, that meant they were rebaptizers, since most people at that stage had been baptized originally into the Church of Rome as infants, uh, while the Anabaptists didn't accept that. Uh, so if you converted to become an Anabaptist, you had to get baptized as an adult. And so they, you find out in England that they were persecuted throughout the 16th century, but the persecution died down in the 17th century. And it's also interesting to note that the Anabaptists came from uh, the Dutch and German peoples, 
you look through church history, you'll find that some of the Anabaptists uh, did keep the Sabbath, and they came from uh, Germany, Switzerland, and apparently I think some also in the Netherlands. Some of the groups related to them used the name uh, Church of God and also practiced uh, something called uh, foot washing, which is something that Jesus implemented in the book of uh, John. Anabaptists taught the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, and they were condemned uh, by the Roman Catholics for that belief, but they were also condemned by the Protestants. Now, a lot of Protestants these days do believe in a millennial reign of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I saw a survey today about various Protestant leaders who believed in uh, some type of millennium. Uh, roughly half of the Protestant leaders that were surveyed, I think it was 49%, did not believe in millennialism, millennialism. In other words, they didn't believe that Jesus is going to come and physically reign on the earth for a thousand years. Then the other half were divided about when this could be, or they didn't know about it. They weren't sure about it. Uh, so modern Protestants would be surprised to find out that Martin Luther and those who followed Martin Luther condemned the Anabaptists for believing in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. They condemned them because they didn't believe in infant baptism. Yet Protestants trace themselves through a particular leader who, who condemned such things. Now it's been claimed that there were a seventh-day group uh, started meeting in Braintree, England, uh, no later than 1527. And that by 1584 in England, there was some controversy uh, about the Sabbath, and there, various ones were arguing about it. And there was a, another church in England called the Milliard Church that was started perhaps in 1585 or perhaps the early 1600s that basically had uh, a lot of Church of God doctrine. Now some Sabbatarians observed something on Passover and uh, the Day of Unleavened Bread. And this is a, a report about them from a priest by the name of uh, Falconer. It says, The 14th of the March moon to coincide with the Jewish Passover should be followed by the eating of unleavened bread for seven days. So this is a comment from a priest who noticed about these, some people then. And he says they also taught against eating swine's flesh. Well, in the Church of God, we do keep Passover on the 14th. We do keep the Days of Unleavened Bread, like the early Christians did. And we uh, do not eat uh, swine's flesh. And other Church of God doctrines, such as the laying out of hands, were also specifically taught at that time. Well, in the 1600s, there were several Sabbath-keeping congregations in England. Uh, in some of the Americas, and I'm going to read something from uh, somebody named O. Leonard, it said, Sabbath keepers in the Middle Ages uh, transferred to America and Rhode Island in the 1600s, and it showed itself in Newport, Rhode Island in 1644. Now, from these groups, many became known as uh, Sabbatarian Anabaptists uh, or Seventh-day Baptists. Now, irrespective of which, what they were called originally, these churches were basically loosely affiliated. They weren't all under one uh, central organization, if you will. Uh, they tended to be more distributed in terms of their uh, governance. But they did exist, and with, with, with uh, various names. Now, what's interesting to me, there was a book written by... Uh, Andrew Duggar and uh, uh, C.O. Dodd on the Church of God's Seventh Day. And they considered that the churches in the 17th and 18th century were part of the Sardis Church that's talked about in Revelation chapter 3. Uh, but they didn't seem to differentiate which ones were truly in the Church of God and which ones weren't. Now I'd like to read something about one of the earliest groups in America. This is a group that was in uh, uh, Piscataway, New Jersey. And there's some, some of their beliefs that were recorded that were recorded in 1705. And so I'm going to read through this. And by the way, if you do have this booklet, uh, these are in this particular booklet. Anyway, one thing it says, the Church of God, so they called themselves the Church of God, this is in 1705, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ, living in 
Piscataway, and Hopewell in the province of New Jersey being assembled with one accord on this 19th day of August, 1705. The faith of this Piscataway church reads as follows. We believed that unto us there is but one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ is mediator between God and mankind and, and the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. And they quote scriptures. We believe that all scripture of the Old and New Testament were given by inspiration and are the word of God in the rule of faith and practice. We, of course, in the continuing Church of God believe that. We believe that the Ten Commandments, which were written on tables of stone by the finger of God, continue to be the rule of righteousness unto all men. And we also teach that. We believe the six principles recorded in Hebrews 6 and to be the rule of faith and practice. And we have a sermon on uh, the basic doctrines of Hebrews 6 at the Continuing COG channel that you can watch. We believe that the Lord's Supper ought to be administered and received in all Christian churches. Well, we don't call it the Lord's Supper, but we do observe uh, Passover. We believe that all Christian churches ought to have church officers in them as elders and deacons, and we have such in the Continuing Church of God. We believe that all persons thus believing ought to be baptized in water by dipping or plunging after confession is made of them of their faith in the above said things. We believe that a company of sincere persons being formed in the faith and practice of the above and things may be truly said to be the church of Christ. By the way, most of the time in the Bible, the term for the church is church of God, but uh, church of Christ is used uh, once in the Bible, in the New Testament. We give up, give up ourselves unto the Lord and one another to be guided and governed by one another according to the word of God. Now it's interesting is that the Seventh-day Baptists now claim that group, even though that group called itself part of the Church of God. They didn't teach the Trinity, and they stated that the Holy Spirit was the Spirit of God. And those are not current Seventh-day Baptist doctrines. They officially now teach the, uh, the Trinity. And it's the non-Trinitarian Church of God that continues to teach the Holy Spirit is the power of God. Now, some Sabbatarians in New Jersey... Uh, uh, encouraged foot washing in 1750, and this practice of foot washing was also followed in Virginia and other churches in West Virginia, and Middle Island Church adopted in 1870. It's still practiced annually, by the way, by groups such as the Continuing Church of God. Now, I've talked about a little bit in England, a little about the United States, but let me talk about Canada. The first Sabbath observers in Canada that we know of were brought to Quebec against their will in March 1757 by a French priest. Most of those ones were ended up being killed for their faith. So Catholic Church people did that. Now although there are a lot of small groups who came the Sabbath in the 1600s to 1800s, changes set in. The Seventh-day Baptist movement uh, overtook many in America and elsewhere, and sadly many of those who stayed in uh, some of the Sabbatarian churches did become Seventh-day uh, Baptists, and they therefore held less of the original faith. The Seventh-day Baptists have basically documented several of the changes from their own pronouncements and booklets, or books. So even though they claim some of these groups throughout history, as a matter of fact, some of the groups I mentioned in the previous sermon they claimed throughout history, there was a clear separation between those who are now called the Seventh-day Baptists and those who are in the Church of God in the late... Uh, uh, 18th century, and definitely by the early 19th century. Even the New London Church, which the uh, Seventh-day Baptist claim was one of theirs from the 1600s, they were incorporated as a Church of Christ and not uh, Seventh-day Baptist in 1784. Now, while there were scattered Sabbath keepers in America, Asia, Africa and Europe in the 1800s, there were a lot of things that were going on in the United States during that time. And that's, again, when we had this particular separation between the Seventh-day uh, Baptists and the Church of God. I'm going to read something from the late John Keyes. He wrote, It's evident that there were Sabbath-keeping groups, independent groups, besides the Seventh-day Baptists, before and during the time of when William Miller's preaching and prediction of the end of the world in 1844. When the Whites, now this is a reference to Ellen and James White, who became the uh, 
founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, made their tours over the eastern and midwestern states in the early 1860s, because they wanted to get everybody together, uh, they found many congregations of Sabbath keepers. Uh, many of them became affiliated with the Seventh-day Adventists, while others kept separate and were known as, or ended up being known as Church of God. And this happened. They didn't, there were churches, Church of God groups, that did not become Seventh-day Baptist or become Seventh-day Adventist. Matter of fact, some of the groups that originally started to somewhat fellowship or affiliate with the Seventh-day Adventists left the Seventh-day Adventists once it uh, became more obvious what was going on with uh, Mrs. White's views, etc. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists have a different view of history. The Seventh-day Adventists want to act like the Church of God came out of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, but that's simply not the case. The Church of God preceded the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Again, it started in Acts chapter 2, around 31 AD. And we've been going through different groups throughout history, and there was no such group as the Seventh-day Adventists until the 19th century. And Church of God groups uh, continued and, and did so. Uh, the Seventh-day Baptists, by the way, and I don't think I have this in this booklet, actually started to be concerned about Church of God people uh, because the Seventh-day Baptists taught the immortality of the soul where the Church of God did not. And there are a variety of other differences that happened. But we have an article at the cogwriter.com website about the Sardis Church era, era that goes into a little more detail about the Seventh-day Baptists and what they believe and, and don't believe. Um, one of the other things that I found interesting is that when they were part of the Church of God, uh, Sabbath keepers groups did not have steeples or all crosses and that kind of stuff. And they didn't call their leaders reverend. But the Seventh-day Baptist, they started to put uh, steeples on their buildings and they called their leaders reverend. And that was, that was a change. And I'm basing this, by the way, on a book from the Seventh-day Baptists where they showed pictures of their old buildings and their new buildings. And somewhere around 1800, between 1780 and, let's say, 1820, there was a major separation. So those who accepted the uh, non-biblical doctrine of the immortality of the soul, certainly not an early original Christian doctrine, uh, those who used the term reverend and those who wanted to believe in the Trinity, they... They, they were Sabbath keepers, but they weren't part of the Church of God uh, from that time on, uh, those who held that position. Now, eventually, maybe I'll do a full uh, sermon on apostolic succession. But by apostolic succession, uh, we in the Church of God handle it a little different than the Church of Rome and the Eastern Orthodox. They claim to have a succession of leaders that somebody was ordained, and then after somebody died, somebody else was ordained and they know who these particular leaders were. We in the Church of God say that the apostolic succession is that God had uh, one primary leader uh, throughout history, whoever that would be. We don't always know who that was, but what the most important thing was whether or not this person uh, kept to true Church of God doctrine. Now, it's not in the booklet, but let me make a couple of comments. When I've done additional research about what happened in the 1500s and 1600s and 1700s, I've been able to document that baptized Church of God people came to the then New World, the Western Hemisphere, uh, from uh, Europe, and therefore, since they had been baptized, we had a, a laying on, and there were leaders, that we had a laying on of hands that passed from the time of the apostles to present. So uh, we do believe that that type of apostolic succession has occurred, and that was A.N. Duggar's uh, position uh, as well. Uh, anyway, he says, the very same faith and practice in divine worship have been definitely handed down to the present time by strong men of God, filled with His blessed Holy Spirit, zealous for the precious commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, fervent in zeal and faithful unto dead, death. And the uh, old uh, Church of God's Seventh Day, just like the Continuing Church of God, we, uh, when we do ordin uh, ordinations, are involved uh, with laying on hands combined with oil. And Duggar taught that the Church of God consisted throughout history based on the churches of Revelation uh, 2 and 3, and there were different church eras. In addition to apostolic succession, 
Ann Duggar felt that there were three things that were distinctive of the Church of God that were not true for the Protestant groups. Well, one is keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath. Of course, some Protestant groups do do this. But he felt the combination of these three is what separated the Church of God. Second, it was non-Trinitarian. Okay. And interestingly, in the 19th century, the 1800s, the Seventh-day Adventists were not Trinitarian either. Uh, they are now, although I've got an email from one or two people said that they're not Trinitarian and I shouldn't teach that Seventh-day Adventists are Trinitarian, but officially the Seventh-day Adventists, by the way, uh, the big Seventh-day Adventist group claims to be Trinitarian. And teaching against the immortality of the soul. So those are the three doctrines that uh, Ann Duggar felt that combination was one reason that the Church of God was distinct. And because of that, he felt that the Church of God had the faith once for all delivered to the saints. He could have also added keeping Passover on the 14th and a bunch of other uh, Church of God practices. Now, when you look through church history, it's interesting. I was talking to uh, Robert Coulter, who was one time, uh, for a couple of decades, I think, the president of Church of God's Seventh Day. I've talked to him on the phone, and I've met, met with him. And I was looking at early church history, and I was looking at his church's history in the 1920s. I said, well, nothing was really going on then. Well, that's not really true. And I told him what was going on, so he was working on a book on church history, and I think he incorporated some of what I told him. And what I told him is, no, in the 1920s, the Church of God Seventh Day had things going on in Argentina, Australia, some of the Balkan states, Barbados, Bermuda, Bolivia, Canada, Costa Rica, China, Cuba, uh, Dominica, El Salvador, England, Guatemala, Honduras, Italy, Jamaica, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, Nicaragua, Norway, Palestine, Panama, South Africa, Sweden, Trinidad, the United States, America, and West Africa. And in 1933, CG7 said they also had congregations in Cuba, Egypt, and Jerusalem. And then they also produced literature in multiple languages, such as English, of course, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, German, Spanish, Chinese, two Indian languages, Portuguese, French, and Italian. And when they did this, the Church of God Seventh Day was actually very small. Now, there are a lot of parallels to this in the continuing Church of God today. Uh, we have literature in, I think, as many languages as they had then. And actually, we've, we're working on a project that I hope to announce uh, fairly soon where we had uh, many times the amount of languages that they reached. But they were trying to, to reach people with what they knew. Now, in 1933, there was a split in CG7. There was a vote, actually, and Ian Duggar side lost. But he decided he didn't have to abide by that vote. He basically split off on his, on his own. And 1933 is the year that we tend to look at as the time when Sardis, the Sardis era of the Church of God, lost its predominance, but that the Philadelphia era began. Now, many people who've heard of the Church of God have heard of Herbert Armstrong. And Herbert Armstrong started to attend uh, with uh, the Church of God uh, Seventh Day in the 1920s. And he, uh, he wasn't sure what to make of them. And I'm going to get back to some stuff with Herbert Armstrong and that, but he was uh, ordained a minister by the Church of God Seventh Day. What I want to do before I go more into Herbert Armstrong, though, is I'll go a little bit more into the Church of God Seventh Day. Now, Herbert Armstrong felt that the uh, Church of God's Seventh Day represented the Sardis era of the Church of Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. And even A.N. Duggar thought that what became the Church of God's Seventh Day uh, had been Sardis. I don't think he believed he was Sardis. But, uh, and A.N. Duggar finally decided that what he needed to do was go over to Jerusalem. He thought that was where the headquarters of the church should be, and so he did some things like that. But the Church of God's Seventh Day has grown considerably since the 1930s in membership, especially in certain parts of uh, Latin America. But it's tended to become a bit more Protestant in its uh, positions on a lot, of, a lot of things. And actually, in 2007, its president at the time, a person by the name of Wade Rose, declared, we are Protestant. Now, I should say that some members of the Church of God's Seventh Day always called themselves the original Protestants, that they originally protested the Church of Rome. 
But we in the continuing Church of God, I want to make this absolutely clear, we are not Protestant. Now I know people in the Roman Catholic faith will ignore that. A lot of times they, they won't pay attention to true church history. But our doctrines were original. We didn't protest Rome. Rome adopted doctrines that their saints opposed in time. Some of their early saints held Church of God doctrines. People they claimed to be early saints held Church of God doctrines that Rome later changed, but we in the continuing Church of God still have. Throughout the Church of God, we've been faithful, faithful to the original doctrines. And we didn't come out of Rome in protest. We would not affiliate with Rome out of protest, if you will, uh, from, from the very beginning. Uh, we've gone through this before, but Polycarp went to Rome, denounced the Bishop of Rome. Polycrates wrote the Bishop of Rome letter and said, we're not going to have anything to do with what you people say. And you go out through, throughout history, you'll find that early Church of God leaders stood up against the heresies that the Greco-Roman and then Protestant churches a lot of times ended up adopting. Now, I'd like to go to Revelation chapter 3 for just a, just a moment. Starting in verse 1, it says, And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, I know your works, you've got a name, but you're alive, but you're dead. Verse 2, be watchful and strengthen these things that remain, which are ready to die. For I haven't found your works perfect before God. Verse 3, remember therefore how you've received and heard, hold fast and repent. So notice, this church was told that they had truths, but they lost them. And they're going to lose more. And they needed to repent. So therefore, if you won't watch, we'll get to that later in a few moments, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. If, yet you've got a few names in Sardis who haven't defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. So the indication is those who don't, don't overcome who are part of Sardis, he is going to blot out. But I will confess his name before my father, and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we see there's a warning to this particular church that they were going to lose uh, truth. And we'll get to that um, in, a, in a few moments. But beforehand, I'd like to go uh, a little further back on this. I mentioned uh, the late Herbert W. Armstrong. And so back in uh, uh, 1916, 1917 or so, whenever it was, his wife had, had a dream. I'd like to read some things that he wrote about this. His, his wife's name was Loma de Armstrong. Well, she got married. It says, within 30 or 60 days of our marriage, God spoke to my wife in what might have been an intense, unusual dream or a vision. But it was years before we came to realize that this really was a message from God. So before he was associated with the Church of God, his wife had some kind of a dream. And so he talks about it. He says, One night my wife had a dream, so vivid and impressive, it overwhelmed and shook her tremendously. It was so realistic, it seemed more like a vision. For two or three days afterwards, everything seemed unreal, as if the days, and only this extraordinary, extraordinary dream seemed real. In her dream, she and I were standing at a wide intersection, only a block or two away from our apartment. Suddenly there appeared an awesome sight in the sky above. It was a dazzling spectacle. The sky filled with a gigantic, solid mass of brilliant stars, shaped like a huge banner. The stars began to quiver and separate, finally vanishing. She called my attention to vanishing stars. When another huge group of vanishing stars appeared, then quivering, separating, and vanishing like the first. So the dream had two parts. As she and I, in her dream, looked upward with the vanishing stars, three white birds suddenly came in the sky between us and the vanishing stars. The great white birds flew directly toward us. As they descended nearer, she perceived they were angels. Then, my wife wrote a day or two after her dream in a letter to my mother, which I have just run across, she says, in my old family pictures. It dawned on me that Christ was coming, and I was so happy. I cried for joy. Then suddenly I thought of Herbert, and I was rather worried. She knew I heard our songs writing this. She knew I had evidenced very little religious interest, even, although we attended a corner church a couple of times. And it seemed from these angels in her dream that Christ descending among them stood directly in front of her, us. 
At first, I was a little doubtful and afraid how he would receive us because I remember we neglected our Bible study and had our minds too much on things apart from God's interest. But we went up to him, he put his arms about both of us, and we were so happy. This is again going back to Mrs. Armstrong's writing. I thought the people all over the world had seen him come. As far as we could see, people were just swarming the streets and broad intersections. Some were glad, some were afraid. Then it seemed like he changed an angel. I was terribly disappointed until he told me that Christ was really coming in a very short time. And then uh, Mrs. Armstrong asked about seeing movies, if it's wrong or not. And they were told Christ has important work for him and is coming. And they wouldn't have time for time for that. So Mr. Armstrong, Herb Armstrong said, I was told this dream and I was embarrassed because I didn't want to think about it. Yet I couldn't totally dismiss it. I was afraid. I just wanted to not pay attention to it. He says, but you know, we've got to be careful not to ascribe all dreams to God uh, because there's warnings about that, he says in Jeremiah 23, verse 32. And he, Herb Armstrong said, certainly I didn't ascribe this dream to God. It made me a little comfortable at the time. I was anxious to forget it which I did for some years. I was 25 at the time. And God left me on my own for five more years. But when I was age 30, he began to deal with me in no uncertain terms. So anyway, Mr. Herbert and Loma Armstrong were married in 1917. They were specifically told they were going to have a work to do. And the bright lights had to do with the work of God. And a work that seemed to vanish and then return. And... This preceded the start of the Philadelphia era of the church, and the Philadelphia of the church, uh, we believe, was uh, was raised up. Uh, uh, the God used Herbert Armstrong to do that, uh, despite his uh, flaws and issues. And I'm going to get through some more things about that, but I want to give more to the dreams. He says he's usually this is something else he wrote. He's usually I'm skeptical about dreams because God speaks to us through the word of God and the Bible is a written word he says I didn't believe in her dream then but 38 years ago subsequent events verified to me that God did speak to my wife at the time and he was calling us to the mission of warning this world to the fast approaching end of the world and the coming of Jesus Christ and the soon ruling kingdom of God he says this time I wasn't converted I didn't attend church I was only interested in business and making money but age 30 God took away my business struck me down took away my idol of money-making and business prestige. Now, the dream was supposed to go until the end of the world of the coming of Jesus Christ. Well, Herbert Armstrong has been dead since 1986. So, again, there were two parts of the dream. And while he helped fulfill the first part of the dream, uh, I don't believe that uh, he could have possibly fulfilled the second part. And we have an article about the dream and some other things about this over in uh, uh, the uh, Continuing COG. Well, we have a sermon at the Continuing COG channel on dreams. We also have an article on dreams at the cogwriter.com website that you can read for more information on the dreams. Why do I say this? Because God does do miracles. God does intervene. And there was something that happened with the Armstrongs well prior to the start of the Philadelphia era of the Church of God that eventually Herbert Armstrong recognized uh, was from God. But I'd like to read something that he wrote in uh, uh, 1926. What happened was his wife had started to read the Bible and was approached by one who kept the Sabbath. And Herbert Armstrong wasn't really thrilled with this idea because to me to him it seemed kind of like an extremist idea. So let me read uh, what he what he wrote about this. Is my shocking, disappointing, eye-opening discovery upon looking into the Bible for myself had revealed in stark plainness that the teachings of traditional Christianity were, in most basic points, the very opposite of the teachings of Christ, of Paul, the original true church. And that's one of the things we've covered, especially in the earlier uh, two sermons, especially the first one uh, in this particular series. It says, Now I read from Jesus where the gates of the grave would not prevail against his church. And, he's, and he said to his disciples who formed the church, Lo, I'm with you always. 
So Herbert Armstrong realized that the original church had to continue throughout history. And it has. And Andrew Duggar realized this as well, who I mentioned before. Then I saw the very purpose of the church was to preach Christ's gospel. It's his body, his instrument, which he carries on God's work. I looked carefully at the gospel that, as Christ himself preached it and taught it to his first ministers. It's recorded in the four books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In almost every point of teaching that Jesus enunciated, the teaching of traditional Christianity, traditional Christian bodies today are the opposite. They're not preaching the same gospel at all. But he felt it was a totally opposite message, and he thought this was shocking. So Jesus began the work of preaching the very gospel which the, God the Father had sent to mankind through him. He commissioned disciples, his church, to carry the same gospel as the message. He said, but where was it going on today? I knew now that when I found the one and only true church, I'd find a church obedient to God, keeping his commandments, having the testimony of Jesus Christ and the truth of what's in Scripture, which, for example, I read from the Piscataway, New Jersey church in 1705. Again, it shows the, the uh, continuity throughout history. Herbert Armstrong continues with, I had been much impressed by a description of the true church as it is found in our time just before the second coming of Christ as found in Revelation 12. My intensive study had revealed one thing plainly. The commandments of God mean Sabbath keeping to most traditional denominations. They say the commandments are done away. They reject the commandments of God. Now I will comment that while many Protestant members believe the commandments are not done away, uh, officially most of their ministers do, and if you come down to it, they do not believe they have to keep uh, the fourth commandment regarding the Sabbath, uh, or it was changed or whatever, and they have exceptions to the sixth commandments and a bunch of other ones. Anyway, so Herbert Armstrong said, well, this is automatically ruled out the churches that kept Sunday. As far as I could tell, it reduced to, to three small groups. The Seventh-day Adventist, the Seventh-day Baptist, and a little, almost unheard of church called the Church of God. I looked at teaching Seventh-day Baptist. I found them virtually identical except observing a different day of the week than other Protestants. So they were too much like the Baptists, he says, so they're not it. But are these three churches... Only one had the right name, and it was a small church. But when he got to this church, it was a disappointment to him. When he got a hold of Church of God's Seventh Day, he saw them, he says, this left me quite confused. It was a little church, especially, he says, when you compare it to the Roman Catholics, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterian, the Lutheran, or other ones with millions of members. But then I saw Jesus Christ said the church would be a little flock. I was deeply perplexed. There was this little church with scattered members, probably numbering less than 2,000, and they were mostly in rural areas. Apparently, as far as I could learn, they only had a very limited number of local churches, and none as many as 100 members. I began to come in contact with some of their leaders. They didn't seem to have real education. They didn't have college degrees. This ministry was not particularly educated. But their preaching had a certain fire, yet it totally seem to lack the power to attract sizable audiences. Could this be one, God's one only true church on earth? He says, to me, he says, this looks preposterous. And today, you find the same thing. People have the same attitude toward the continuing church of God. Yet, small, powerless, resultless, and impotent it appeared. Here is a church that had the right name, was keeping the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, and it was closer in its doctrines and teachings to what the Bible had been opening their eyes to. At the same time, God was opening my understanding of some biblical church truths which this church did not accept, and also some errors which it did embrace. Now back on, in the late 1920s, Herbert Armstrong had written back and forth to the Church of God's Seventh Day, and I'd like to read a response that Andrew Duggar gave Herbert Armstrong in writing, February 26, 1929. Brother Armstrong, I feel we are entering a new era for this message, and it's going to take on new life. In fact, the time for the new message is here now. So remember I said that we tend to believe that the Philadelphia era of the church started to have prominence in 1933. So roughly four years after Ann Duggar said a new era was starting to raise up, we believe God used Herbert Armstrong to raise up the Philadelphia era. And 
basically some other things happened at the same time. Herbert Armstrong brought up some stuff about Anglo-Israelism, etc. And Ann Duggar said, I read it. You are surely right, he wrote, uh, July 28, 1929. You are surely right. I cannot use it. May the Lord bless you. Okay, so he gets truth. Ann Duggar. He says it's truth. It is right. But he can't use it. Now, Herbert Armstrong wasn't the only one associated with the Church of God Seventh Day who believed in what's called Anglo-Israelism. But, and by the way, that's got to do with physical blessings, not spiritual. Uh, we believe people of all races, colors, uh, uh, languages can, uh, can be saved in this age, whatever God will call. But, Ann Duggar wouldn't teach it because he felt that uh, he would lose a following. And that was another major disappointment. And in June of 1931, Herbert Armstrong had his hand, had hands laid upon him and was ordained a minister by Church God Seventh Day. But he had other problems with that group. So here's something else he wrote. I didn't fully realize it then, but this is a crucial turning point in the history of Church of God. My wife and I didn't leave the church. This was God's church. Of that, I was not then completely sure. They were closer to the biblical truth than any other, but I was seriously disturbed by their lack of power and accomplishment. What was actually happening, though, we didn't know it then, was a new era was dawning in the history of the Church of God. The words of Christ are quoted in the second and third chapters of Revelation for telling the history of God's Church in seven successive eras or phases. Events have since then shown this was a transition from the Sardis era of Revelation 3, 1 through 5, to the beginning of the Philadelphia era. He says, Mrs. Armstrong and I continue to fellowship with these brethren. I continue to work with them and their ministers as much as possible. Uh, then he started to go on to radio to get the gospel out in more power, which, by the way, is something we in the Continuing Church of God also do. Um, I regularly, I often do uh, uh, radio interviews, and Herbert Armstrong felt that the gospel kingdom needed to be to the world as a witness. Now, I'd like to read uh, some other things that Herbert Armstrong wrote about the. Uh, about this. He said, but Christ said to the Philadelphia church era, excuse me, but Christ said to his Philadelphia era church that because we have but a little strength, he would open those doors to us. Revelation 3 verse 8. So if you're still in Revelation, let's let's go down to Revelation 3 verses uh, uh, 7 and, and 8. And if you're not, you can come over here if you'd like. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he has the king of, the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and he who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, if not denied my word, and if not denied my name. And I'm not going to go through all the other scriptures, but if you look at some of Paul's writings, he explains that an open door is to proclaim the gospel. And Herbert Armstrong felt that the time for this new era was to come. He may have thought about it because, amongst other reasons, Ann Duggar wrote him a few years before, said it's time for a new era. Duggar believed in Sardis. Well, after Sardis would come Philadelphia. At least that's the sequence in the Bible. So it's a logical sequence to, to consider. And then, he, then Herbert Armstrong wrote, the purpose of the church which Christ built was to exempl exemplify its work. Number one, to announce to the world for witness the coming kingdom of God. And two, to prepare the people to whom God adds to the church. God's always worked with humans. The work consists of proclaiming the gospel by radio, by television, in print. So that's what he believed. And that's what he went, set out to do. For a time... Uh, the uh, Church of God, the radio, it was called the Radio Church of God actually at first, and it was one of the most, if not the most, widely listened to uh, religious uh, programs, and it was on uh, all, over, all over the world, more heavily, of course, in North America, but it was not, it was on in, in Europe uh, and in shortwave in Asia and various other places. It was, uh, it was gone quite a bit. Television, uh, the uh, Church of God was uh, heavily into television. Now we in the continuing Church of God still use radio. As far as television, we use what I call YouTube television, which means basically we make uh, the, these videos, make them available um, 
which can be watched on various televisions at these days. Uh, it's much more cost effective, but it also reaches people that conventional television does not reach. We've reached people in 200 and some uh, countries who have actually watched our sermons and sermonettes. So we've reached people that particular way. And Herbert Armstrong heavily believed in putting out a magazine and putting out booklets and literature. I, mean, I mentioned this booklet a few times. Uh, but we have other booklets. We have booklets on Holy Days, Where is a True Christian Church Today, uh, Prayer, uh, Faith, uh, and the Gospel of the Kingdom of God. Anyway, Herbert Armstrong also personally met with world leaders uh, in Europe, North America, Africa, India, China, Japan, Philippines, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, and elsewhere to be a witness to the world. At one time, around 20 million people per month read the old Worldwide Church of God magazine called uh, The Plain Truth. It then went to about 194 countries by print, and countries or territories, out of about 204 that were considered to be possible then. Through the internet, we've reached 220-some nations or territories, uh, as AW Stats counts them. Uh, so we've, and we've actually reached uh, countries or territories that the old uh, Worldwide Church of God and Radio Church of God were not able to, to reach. Anyway, those in the old Radio Church of God and Worldwide Church of God were sometimes branded as members of a cult, uh, and various Protestants and Catholics uh, sometimes interfered with Herbert Armstrong's ability to get the gospel out in various media. Now, Herbert Armstrong understood that God's way was a way of give, in contrast to Satan's way, the way of get. He also understood that the individual person for each human was to be able to give love in a unique way. You might look at, let's say, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 28 about that. We also have an article at the cogwriter.com website on the meaning of life. If you haven't read it, you may want to go into more details. And humans should build character. It's important to build character in this life so God can use us in the, in the next. And he understood the meaning of life had to do with what God's doing through people now, throughout the church age, which again began Acts chapter 2 and will run until the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God on earth. Now, one other thing that I've alluded to a couple of times that Herbert Armstrong mentioned that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to mention here has to do with doctrines that were lost. One thing that distinguishes the continuing Church of God from the, the Greco-Roman Protestant or Eastern Orthodox churches is the fact that we hold two doctrines that were original doctrines to the Christian church. You say, well, all, all churches claim that. Well, they may claim it, but actually the Church of Rome and the Eastern Orthodox also claim to get their doctrine from tradition. And people say, well, what's wrong with that? If it's, well, if it was truly a tradition of the original apostles, which according to the Church of Rome, supposedly it is, you wouldn't see a lot of things that you see, for example, in their, their churches that you've seen in the well, even the 21st century. You see how their ministry is dressed. Uh, that type of dress came from the time of Constantine. You hear that they mumble various things when they consecrate a Eucharistic host. Those things did not come from the Bible. The Church of Rome will tell you, for example, that uh, for taking Passover, bread was broken. There was no such thing as a rounded host. Uh, various other doctrines and stuff that they hold. They, If you study far enough, you'll find that it's not too hard to find a Catholic scholar that will admit that they changed something or that something was not an original belief. Well, why bring that up at this stage? Well, one thing that Herbert Armstrong felt was when he looked at uh, church history. Now, he was not a church historian per se, but he spent a lot of time uh, in libraries, and I, I'm fairly certain, based on some of his writings, he must have read at least certain portions of the Catholic Encyclopedia and other things. He said a couple of things. One thing he said was to learn the history of the Church of God. He says it can be done. He says, but in order to do it, you're often going to have to look at the writings of those who are Church of God enemies. 
And I took him at his word on that. So a dozen or so years ago, I started looking into church history, plus or minus. I don't remember exactly when it was. I could go back and look. And I found that he was right, that either writings of Church of God enemies or writings that were preserved by Church of God enemies, if you look at both of those, or writings of people who didn't accept the Church of God but still had some Church of God doctrines. If you look at all of those from the, let's say, uh, well, it's not many in the first century outside the scripture, but uh, first, second, third, uh, fourth centuries, you'll find that there were various truths that the original Christian church had. And the reason we're bringing this up now is though A. N. Duggar is correct that the Church of God was not Trinitarian, uh, the Church of God uh, did not uh, believe in the uh, immortality of the soul, and the Church of God believed in, uh, in proper uh, uh, baptism, and they kept the Seventh-day Sabbath. Okay. There were some other things that throughout history were lost. Now remember, when I was reading Revelation 3, I want to go back there before I read something else from Herbert Armstrong, related to Herbert Armstrong. Jesus said to the church of Sardis, church of God of Sardis, Revelation 3, verse 2, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. So Jesus is telling this particular era of the church, or the phase of this church, that they lost a lot of doctrines. They were still church of God but they lost a lot of doctrine. Now, Herbert Armstrong declared uh, in, a, in a, one of his books, a book called uh, uh, The Mystery of the Ages, and also he's declared in a sermon once, that God used him to restore 18 truths that the original Church of God had for the Ephesus, Ephesus era or, in, or the Smyrna era as the Church of God had that the Sardis era did not have, at least when he encountered, encountered the Sardis era, they didn't hold to these. So I'm going to list uh, his, his 18. Now, I'm not going to go to them in great depth right now. I'm actually planning on a, a sermon soon uh, about the, the 18 truths. I'm going to go into them in more depth. But there are 18 things he felt God used him to restore to the Church of God seventh day that they had lost. So let me read his 18 and I'll make some brief comments about each one as we get to them. Number one, and this is according to Herbert Armstrong's list, not the Tkach list that other people looked at later that came out in, I think, 1986 or 7. And I'll go in that more depth in another sermon. First thing he said he helped restore was the true gospel. He said they didn't fully understand the gospel of the kingdom of God. Well, they understood about you know, Jesus coming and Jesus dying for our sins, but there are other parts they did not grasp well enough, and they certainly didn't emphasize the return of Jesus Christ and what the kingdom of God was all about. And he felt that they did not understand the gospel of the kingdom of God, and that was one of the reasons why God had to raise up the Philadelphia era of the church to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And you go to Matthew 24, 14, and it says, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the world as a witness, and the end will come. And so he knew that this gospel message had to get out to the world as a witness, and he could see that the Sardis church in the 19th century and the 20th century, early 20th century, they weren't doing it to any great degree. And it's not that they didn't have some followers in different places. Again, I read a list of where they had people. But he said they did not understand the true gospel uh, like they should have. He said that they didn't understand what God's purpose was for humanity, and he also said that they didn't understand God's plan uh, through the holy days. Now, this part's kind of interesting. Back then, there were some people in the Church of God who kept the holy days. There weren't very many. And Herbert Armstrong and his wife uh, decided that they had to keep all of them. Now, Church of God Seventh Day was only keeping Passover, which sometimes they called the Lord's Supper. Now, they're keeping it on the right day, which is uh, the 14th of the first month of the Hebrew calendar and apparently keeping it the right way, but they didn't keep the other holy days. Uh, they were not keeping the days of leavened bread, 
Uh, Pentecost they probably somewhat kept, uh, but uh, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, uh, Feast of Tabernacles basically was not being kept, although there are some, some people who were not part of the uh, A.N. Duggar group or the group that split to there. There were other Seventh-day Sabbath keepers who seemed to be keeping the Holy Days at the time. Well, anyway, Herbert Armstrong brought up the Holy Days, Ann Duggar wouldn't do it. But after Ann Duggar left, after some time after the split, Ann Duggar reportedly did start to keep the Holy Days. Uh, whether it was all of them or not, I'm not certain. But he, he himself decided to start to keep the Holy Days. Herbert Armstrong felt that he restored this to the Philadelphia era of the Church of God, that the main body of the Sardis Church had lost. He also believed, number four, that he implemented proper biblical hierarchical governance. Uh, Church of God, Seventh Day, was split. They had voting. They had some other things that the Church of God don't do. And he felt that was the truth that, that, that they lost. And he also didn't believe they fully understood who and what God was and uh, what and why man was. That's number six. He felt they didn't understand that there was a spirit in man which is separate from the Holy Spirit and is different from the spirit that animals had. He also believed that they didn't understand that those who are called in this age are first fruits. He also didn't think they truly understand uh, what the millennium was, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. They didn't truly understand the truth about the Holy Spirit. They didn't understand, he said, that uh, Christians are uh, begotten now by the Holy Spirit. That was number 11. And they'll be born again at the resurrection. Uh, they didn't under, accept the identity of physical Israel, but as I said, when I've looked through writings of Church of God leaders in the 17th, 18th, 19th, uh, 20th centuries, uh, for I think one or two of those centuries at least, there were a couple of people who seemed to be part of Sardis who did believe in the identity of physical Israel. And he said, because they didn't understand that, they didn't understand, number 14, how understanding the identity of physical Israel opens up certain aspects of biblical prophecy. Number 15, he didn't, they didn't keep second and third tithe, which he, with, uh, Herbert Armstrong felt as something that should have been kept. Uh, 16, he felt they watered down the identity of Babylon and their, and their daughters. I think the early Sardis era understood that, but the later Sardis era didn't understand that. And he also said they didn't fully understand that Satan has deceived the whole world. And number 18, that how separate we should be from the rest of the world in terms of their uh, religion. And now you, some of these things, people in Church of God said they would say are not really issues, but what's happened is that they've lost more and more truths over time. Now, one scripture that I want to go back to is uh, Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse, uh, I guess it's 3. Remember, therefore, how you've received and heard. Hold fast and repent. In other words, change. I'm talking to Christians, you have to repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I'm going to come upon you as a thief, and you won't know what hour I'm going to come upon you. Well, why bring this out? Well, the Church of God, Seventh Day, has become a preterist church. What is a preterist church? We have an article at the Godgrader.com website on that. We have a sermon at the Continuing COG channel on that that you could watch. But basically, what preterists teach is that the book of Revelation has already come to pass. Now, Church of God, Seventh Day, still thinks there might be a millennium. Okay? But... Uh, the persecutions and other things that are talked about in the book of Revelation, they specifically teach, have already come to pass. They're not expecting the great tribulations. They believe that happened already. And that's simply not the case. And if you believe the great tribulation has already happened, obviously you're not waiting to, to see it uh, and wanting to take action when it does happen. You're not deciding that you have to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God as the world's witness for the end to come because the end has already basically come as far as they're concerned. And that's an error. So they've lost more and more truth. Now, that started happening in the 20th century. But in the 21st century, and again, my focus really is just through the 20th century in this sermon, They've even started to water down the Sabbath. Now, they wrote an article, or they published an article, 
in the September-October 2010 edition of the Bible Advocate. This is page 7. Now this particular article I didn't have when I was writing this particular booklet. Okay, So uh, since I just saw this article, with, I guess about a week ago somebody sent it to me. I'm going to read the question and some of the answer. Please reiterate our position on the Sabbath. If due to, econo to the economy, a member who's a deacon takes a job requiring him to work late on Friday, means in other words he works past sunset on Friday, but he still attends Sabbath day services, does God's mercy allow him to continue as a deacon? How would you handle this? So they sent this in, and a Church of God Seventh day minister by the name of Jose Antonio Vega responded, and this is what they, and they published this. Now before they published it, here, there, here's their answer. There's, a, there's an editorial comment here. I'm going to assume that's from Calvin Burrell, who I've spoken to in numerous times. And here's what he put in before you read, I get in the answer. Not official policy. Here's a respected pastor's answer to a not uncommon problem in COG7. Reader response is invited. This article starts, the answer starts off, answer, we're no longer under the old covenant law, but under the new covenant. Uh, we're under no obligation to keep the ceremonies of the ancient sanctuary. Does this mean we're without the law? He says, no. What about the Sabbath day? He said, well, Jesus uh, condemned the Pharisees for condemning doing good on the Sabbath day. He didn't do away with the holiness of the Sabbath. He says the Sabbath continues to be glorious. He says every believer must strive out of love to dedicate the glorious Sabbath to the Lord. When forced to work, he does not violate the law of love. When forced to work, in very few societies are you actually forced to work. What I mean by that is you might lose your job, yes, but they're not actually going to force you and chain you to something and keep beating you until you do, do something or anything along that line. So he's saying that even a, a deacon in the church is allowed to work on the Sabbath if he thinks he needs to. He says this is because he continues to love his Lord in his day, regretting he can't keep it as he wished. But if he couldn't attend Sabbath services, he can't hold an important office in the church. So, basically saying, it's okay to violate the Sabbath, work in the Sabbath, and get paid for working on the Sabbath. As long as you can show up to church, that's, that's totally fine. The deacon who is required to work in a dark art of the Sabbath to provide for his household is not wrong. He can continue to serve because he attends worship during the day when the church activities take place. And he knows what's happening. Of course, he, has, he doesn't have the faith that he needs to keep the Sabbath. It takes faith to keep the Sabbath when your employer threatens you. And the Church of God Seventh day has lost this. And by the way, according to the person who sent me a copy of this uh, article from the uh, uh, Bible News, excuse me, the Bible Advocate, in November of 2010, right after this article was published, the guy who wrote it, Jose Antonio Vega, was voted the Pastor of the Year right after this. Okay? So, while CG7 might say this is not their official policy, then they shouldn't have honored somebody as Pastor of the Year after this was published. I found this outrageous, and it's showing that the Church of God Seventh Day is learning, uh, learning, losing more and more of the truth, and that was prophesied. And it was prophesied because they've lost more and more of the truth. They're not going to know when the end is going to come until it's it's too late. So anyway, Herbert Armstrong started to see some of the falling away from the truth that had occurred in CG Seven. They hadn't gone. They were still keeping the Sabbath when he was with them. But again, throughout time, we've seen more and more. Now, Herbert Armstrong died in the uh, 20th century. And I'd like to, since my focus on this is the church through the 20th century, 
I'd like to read a couple of thoughts that Herbert Armstrong had about the end time uh, work. Now I'm going to first read something from uh, Dale Scherter. Now I have uh, my wife and I met him at the Feast of Tabernacles years ago. He was one of the speakers uh, when we attended the feast. And uh, let me think of the year around 1990 plus or minus. I don't remember exactly. It could have been 1990. Well, anyway, here is something that he said Herbert Armstrong told him in uh, either 1984 or 1985. And actually he's got two different versions. Let me start with uh, the 1980. One time he says 84, another time something else. He says, when Herbert Armstrong was uh, 91, about 1984, his wife Mona and I, she says, Mona and I, that's uh, Dale Schroeder's wife, had the opportunity to spend several hours with him in his home in Pasadena to visit and further report on the work he had commissioned us to do. We would report directly back to him. He talked freely of the mighty work God had given him to accomplish. He went on to say there was yet a bigger work still to be done, to go again and repeat what had been done, but with more power, with a stronger warning, just before the work the two witnesses would begin. He said it would be the short work of Romans 9, 27 to 29, and he compared it with the longer time to complete the work he'd been given, and he said it would be cut short. And that's when the Great Tribulation would begin, as would the work of the two witnesses. And that would last for three and a half years. That was one account from Dale Scherter. I'd like to read another account from Dale Scherter. It says, A few months before Mr. Armstrong's death, my wife and I had the opportunity to spend several hours with Mr. Armstrong at his home in Pasadena. He spoke freely of the mighty work God commissioned him to accomplish and related several heartfelt comments, and here, such as, this is what, her, what he said Herbert Armstrong said. I can say I finished the work God has given me to do, and I'm at peace about it. I have preached and taken the gospel of the kingdom into all the worlds and witnessed to all nations. Then Dale Scherter writes, Mr. Armstrong went on to say, quote, I've come to realize there'll be an even greater work to follow, to go again, to prophesy again to all nations and peoples before the work of the two witnesses, but with more power and a stronger warning message. But that will be others to do, he continued. It will be a short work, Romans uh, 9, 27, 29, compared with a longer time to complete the work I was given, and it will be cut short. That's when the great tribulation will begin, as it will be the work of the two, as will the work of the two witnesses. This will last for three and a half years, at the end of which Christ will return in glory. So Herbert Armstrong felt that God had given him roughly uh, 52 and a half years to do the phase of the work that God had him do. But that sometime after his death, a shorter work would rise up and it would go with more power to do something else. Now, I've commented so far about what Dale Scherter said, Herbert Armstrong said. Now I'd like to read a quote from Herbert Armstrong. And this is what he wrote in his last letter. And I remember getting his last letter uh, a couple days before he died. Herbert Armstrong wrote, this is dated January 10th, 1986, uh, so within a week of his death. He wrote, The greatest work lies ahead. Never before in the history of the church has it been possible to reap so great a harvest. It's only been made possible through modern technology, beginning with the printing press, radio, television. And in the 21st century, we have a technology that Herbert Armstrong never had before. That's the Internet. Each of you must commit yourself to support God's work. God's work must push ahead as never before. God is opening up new doors in television. And I believe that YouTube television and uh, uh, other Internet-type television is part of the new door that God uh, has, has opened up. Now, before I get to that, I'd like to say a couple other things. I'd like to read something that Herbert Armstrong wrote, in the, again, in the 20th century. And because I've been talking you know, about church history, sometime in this sermon I talk a little bit about why the church, but I'd like to read some more that Herbert Armstrong wrote about this. This is from his book, The Mystery of the Ages. He writes, Now why the church? Christ came also to call out and select chosen ones from Satan's world to turn from Satan's way into the way of God's law and to qualify to reign with Christ when he comes to replace Satan 
on the throne of the earth. Those called into the church were called not merely for salvation or eternal life, but to learn the way of God's government and to develop divine character during this mortal life of the church age. God's master plan calls for offering salvation and eternal life to every person ever born. And his plan, but his plan does so in a time order. Those called out of the world and into the church at this time are called for a specific purpose and a specific work. The specific work was to make possible the spiritual training to aid in the conversion of humanity as a whole. So what he's saying is, some of the reasons why people are called now is so when others are called later, we can assist them. And if we die during the church age, and there have been Christians who've died throughout the church age, obviously, they'll be resurrected to assist them. It says, this specific work during this age, he meant, was to make possible the spiritual training to aid in the conversion of humanity as a whole. They are called at a time when they are persecuted and fought against by Satan and the rest of the world. The rest of the world will be called at a time when Satan is removed and they are aided and helped by Christ and the saints then made immortal in the kingdom of God. Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving world and, the, and professed traditional Christianity to this fact. He cites 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Satan has deceived the entire world, including professing traditional Christianity. God has called and still calls and prepares his church to overcome Satan, whereas those now blinded and uncalled and cut off from God have not overcome Satan. Why? Why the church? That we may qualify to rule with and under Christ in the kingdom of God, that we may prepare the way for the ultimate call of salvation of the entire world. And that was an original church of God belief. It was an original Christian belief. And even the Eastern Orthodox, by the way, still believe that. You know, the Bible says in Psalm uh, 68, verse 20, that our God is a God of salvation. And in Luke 3, verse 6, it says, all flesh will, be, will see the salvation of God. And all are going to have an opportunity in the age to come. Now, Herbert Armstrong also taught that a, a group that would come after the Philadelphia era would be Laodicean. Well, Herbert Armstrong died on January 16, 1986. And this is apparently the time when the Philadelphia era ceased becoming prominent. And the Laodicean era began. Now, at first, Herbert Armstrong had, well, actually, toward the end of his life, he had appointed somebody by the name of Joseph Tkach to take over for him. And that was mentioned in the last letter uh, that I received uh, from Herbert Armstrong and that, that, he, that he sent out while he was alive. Now, he publicly pledged to continue the same teachings, etc., that Herbert Armstrong had. And he did this in the 20th century. But there are a couple things that he did. One, he quit teaching church errors. That's like the, probably the first change that he made. And secondly, he came up with his own list of the 18 truths. They're not exactly the same as those that Herbert Armstrong had. As I say, I'm planning on doing a sermon about that in, in the future. But in time, Joseph Tkach wasn't Laodicean. He was apost he, he, he apostatized. He, they got rid of the Ten Commandments. They said you should work on the Sabbath if you need to work. Uh, they said you can eat unclean uh, foods, etc., etc. Now, a couple of months before he died, I was actually invited into his home, and I got to meet with him. By this time, I had concluded that he made too many changes in the Church of God uh, to be a true Christian, a true Church of God leader. And after I was in his house and saw various things, I was more and more convinced that uh, there was no way the then the changed worldwide Church of God could be uh, the, the Church of God. So uh, at this time, I had become interested in a group called uh, the Global Church of God and uh, started to attend with them. And then, because of misstatements by various ones, toward the end of the 20th century, uh, the, there was a shift over in the Global Church of God, another group called Living Church of God formed, and various things happened uh, since this, that time. But my focus for today was to cover basically an overview of what happened in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. There's more details uh, at the uh, cogwriter.com website, and there's a lot of details in this free booklet we have, The Continuing History of the Church of God, which you can find at the ccog.org uh, website.
for more of that kind of information. But to summarize what happened, after 1260 years of being in the wilderness, the church started to rise up again because legally uh, they, they, could, they could survive without being killed or persecuted as heavily. But that church started to lose truths. There were some who tried to get it to accept the immortality of souls, some tried to get it to accept uh, visions from Ellen White, some tried to get it to accept the Trinity and various other things. And sadly, throughout Church of God history, this type of thing happened. During the Tkach era, in the 20th century, when he started to water things down and started to teach against God's law, there was a great falling away at that time. Now the Bible prophesied a falling away would take place and by the way, we also have a sermon, two sermons actually on the falling away. And there's an article about that if you want more information. And this is one of the reasons why the Church of God right now is smaller than it was in the 20th century. Because there was, there was a great falling away. In the 21st century, that work still needs to be done. The work that uh, Loma Armstrong had a vision of two parts of it. One part, her husband fulfilled and he said he filled the work that God gave him to do, and another part that would be fulfilled later, right up until the time Jesus Christ was going to return. And that's something that we in the Continuing Church of God are doing in the 21st century. And we plan on having more sermons about history that will go into more detail. But again, if you want just a summary of church history, and a lot of documented facts. I mean, in addition to having... Uh, multitude of scriptures. This particular little booklet has 307 references. I just looked in the back. 307 endnotes for references from outside of scripture that demonstrate why the true church of God is the continuing church of God is the most faithful church of God from the book of Acts chapter 2 to present. This is, uh, so if you want to learn more about church history, check out this booklet and check out our websites. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.